The Rings of Power concluded almost one year ago, and many consider it a colossal failure. After rewatching the series and spending a whole week studying dozens of people's responses, can we say every single part of this show was a historic failure? Today we're going to discuss which parts stunk, which parts were quite decent, and the one major lesson all studios should learn. All this starts now. Chapter 1. The Tolkien Conundrum as we all know, The Lord of the Rings is not an IP created by Amazon or even Peter Jackson for that matter. The Lord of the Rings exists because of the wonderful mind of J.R.R. Tolkien. His works of Middle-earth have existed for almost a hundred years now, and over the decades millions of fans have grown to love his world. So just like any adaptation out there, The Rings of Power needed to properly balance staying faithful to Tolkien's world and creating changes for the new medium. Every reasonable person knows that any adaptation needs to make some changes. The Lord of the Rings movies, movies mind you that are borderline universally beloved, made some changes to the books that Tolkien wrote. Now the same goes for not changing too much. Why do you think this show is titled The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power? Well, because The Lord of the Rings is an already existing IP that has millions of fans. The reason Amazon gave this show the largest budget in TV history is because they know that a vast majority of people are going to tune in simply because it has The Lord of the Rings in the title. So if you're profiting off of The Lord of the Rings title, then you owe it to The Lord of the Rings IP that you stay as faithful as possible. Now all over the place when I see what fans are saying online, the major changes the show made with the source material is often the topic most discussed. Do I blame Tolkien fans for being upset with Amazon for the majority of changes they made? No I don't, because I think a reason a lot of these changes were made were because of poor reasons. As I stated before, the Lord of the Rings film trilogy made a handful of changes. A more famous example is the exclusion of Tom Bombadil from the movies. Peter Jackson explained that the character's contribution to the Fellowship of the Ring bore little relevance to the overall plot and did nothing to advance the main story. So while I'm sure a lot of Tolkien fans would have liked to have seen Tom Bombadil in the movie, they understand the change was made with good intention. Now I'm not going to sit here and talk like I'm an expert on Tolkien's world. I'm not. If you expect this video to discuss every change the show made from the books and how it supposedly betrays Tolkien and his universe, this video is not for you. I haven't read the Silmarillion and I haven't read the appendices from the Lord of the Rings books. Now if you feel me not being a Tolkien expert invalidates my opinion on the Rings of Power TV series, then you can click off now. I'm sorry to have lost you. The point I'm trying to make is that just because myself and thousands of others may not pick up on every change being made to the source material, that does doesn't mean it's a good idea. I watched this video from the Nerd of the Rings YouTube channel, a great channel for hardcore Tolkien fans by the way. In their discussion of the Rings of Power, they had this to say about the changes they made to how the elves formed the Rings of Power. There's another quote from the showrunners about not wanting book fans to be five or so episodes ahead of the story, to which I simply ask, why? Why change such a massive part of the story purely to create a mystery? If the story you're writing is compelling, you don't need the crutch of a mystery. And changing a story because the diehard fans will know what is going on? What kind of reason is that? I couldn't agree more with Nerd of the Rings here. And a perfect example of this is with House of the Dragon. Both The Rings of Power and House of the Dragon are not adaptations of novels. They're adaptations of summaries of the histories of their respective worlds. Now, unlike The Rings of Power, when I was watching House of the Dragon, I knew pretty much everything that was going to happen. And seeing it play out almost exactly like the books was such a great experience from a hardcore fan's perspective. So sure, I wasn't surprised per se, but if anything it made my viewing experience more enjoyable. Adding mystery just so hardcore fans are also left surprised is not a good reason to add a mystery. So to hear this line of thinking from the showrunners of The Rings of Power was simply jarring. And this is just one example of a major mistake I feel the showrunners made when adapting this story. Now going forward, I'm not going to talk about the changes to the source material. I'm not the person qualified to do that. So even though I do think mass changes are a bad idea and some Something no studio or writer should do upon adapting a story, I do think there is plenty of merit in analyzing this show as if it were its own thing. Most people who watched this show don't know the source material, so this video is going to analyze what the show did poorly and well from that perspective. If that bothers you, then I don't know what to say. So let's finally discuss the Rings of Power. Chapter 2 The Pacing 
Everyone loves to talk about the characters and the narrative of a show or movie, and while those are, of course, the most important parts of any story, I want to talk about another flaw this series has before I talk about the characters and the narrative, and that's the pacing. If you want a quick understanding of how important pacing is to a movie or show, just look up the first cut of the original Star Wars movie. It had the same story, but it was borderline unwatchable because of the pacing. Certain scenes were in a different order, and other narrative elements were missing that caused the final battle to lack any tension. So with the Rings of Power, what exactly causes the pacing to be rather poor? Well, it has to do with the approach the show took in telling its four main plot lines. There's the Galadriel, Halbrand, and the Numenor plot, there's the Elrond and Durin plot, there's the Southlands plot with Rondir, and then there's the Harfoot plot. Now having numerous plot lines going on in a show is not bad by any means. Just look at Game of Thrones. That series had so many different plot lines going on at once, and it was mostly fantastic. Now, I'm not saying Lord of the Rings is like Game of Thrones. I know Tolkien's world is vastly different from Martin's world, but the approach both the Rings of Power and HBO's Game of Thrones took to crafting its series is quite similar. So let's compare the two. In Game of Thrones, the series pretty much begins with everyone at Winterfell, and then as the story progresses, we follow different characters and their journeys, and the scope of this show branches out. So in Season 1, pretty much every storyline can be traced back to a single point in Winterfell. If we were to draw a narrative map of where everyone is from the beginning to the end of Season 1, they would all be together and then branch out from there. This is what I call the tree branch approach, for a lack of a better title. Now what about Daenerys? More on her in a second. The Rings of Power does not have this approach. We begin by following Galadriel, then we cut to Arondir in the Southlands, then we cut to the Harfoots wandering around, then we cut to Elrond chilling in a tree. Yes, Galadriel and Elrond Elrond do cross paths in the first episode and then their stories go on from there, but narratively that isn't the case. In terms of the stories they both go on, they don't branch from the same place. They just kind of cross paths briefly and separate after that. So if we were to map the main plot lines of the Rings of Power, it would look something like this. This is what I call the airline approach, again for a lack of a better title. If you look at a map of flights, they're all over the place, kind of like the story of the Rings of Power. Now why is this such a problem? Problem. Why is the tree branch approach so much better than the airline approach? Well, for one, the tree branch approach is simply way easier for the audience to follow. Because to begin the show, the narrative is only asking the audience to follow one narrative thread. And then over time, we slowly branch out, so the audience can adjust to the many different narrative threads going on. With the airline approach, right off the bat, the story is asking the audience to keep track of all these different narrative threads. And that can be overwhelming to a first-time viewer, especially in a a fantasy series where so many aspects of the lore need to be established. So that, I feel, is the fundamental problem with the Rings of Power. Now, if you do this airline approach, that doesn't automatically mean your story sucks. Going back to Game of Thrones, this story really isn't a tree branch. It has a tree branch, and then it has this one other story with Daenerys out east. So why does it work with Game of Thrones and not the Rings of Power? The biggest difference between the two is direction. In Game of Thrones, when we jump stories to Daenerys and Viserys, right from the start we understand the purpose of this storyline. The Targaryens were once the royal family, they were overthrown, and now they are trying to get the Iron Throne back. Understanding the purpose of a side story is so crucial to keeping the audience invested. In Season 2, a new side story is introduced following Stannis. Right from the start, we know that Stannis is amassing an army to take the Iron Throne, so the storyline has direction. If we look at the Rings of Power, more specifically with the Harfoot storyline, after the entire season, we still don't really really know the purpose of this storyline. Yeah, a wizard shows up, but all we can say for now is that we assume the wizard will somehow factor into the fight against Sauron, but that is literally the case with any side story. If the side story exists, then it has to eventually tie into the main story at some point by definition. If it doesn't, then you're just wasting the audience's time. With the MCU, every time a new movie comes out that follows a new character, yeah, it's telling its own story, but we also assume it will somehow factor into the Avengers films at some point. This is what we call direction. If the audience is watching a side story and they are left to wonder how this is going to tie into everything, then they will lose interest. The biggest reason most people dislike the Harfoot storyline is because the other three storylines are related in some way, but the Harfoot story is not. Going back to Daenerys' story, it also doesn't hurt that the main story with Ned Stark references the side story on multiple occasions. Every few episodes they are updated on what's going on with the Targaryen 
Guardians and a major rift between Robert and Ned has to do with how they plan on handling Daenerys. So in the Rings of Power, if you were to remove the Harfoot storyline entirely, absolutely nothing would be affected in the rest of the stories, except for, I guess, seeing a meteor falling from the sky. Now, of course, it is easy for me to critique this show. Anyone on YouTube can do that. So what I'd like to do now is not really do a rewrite, but a rework of the series. Again, I have many issues with a lot of the characters' stories, and I will get to that, but for the purposes of this section, I'm going to keep the story mostly the same, but just shift things around to improve the pacing. First, I'm going to explain how I'd personally fix the Harfoot storyline, then I'll explain how to fix the rest of the series. So what would I do with the Harfoots? I would completely cut them out from the entire season. As I stated earlier, nothing happens there that affects the rest of the show, so it is not necessary. But Goldman, Nori, and the Wizard are clearly going to affect the story in later seasons. This is true. I strongly assume that the Wizard will meet Galadriel and Elrond and maybe even Sauron at some point, so even though I am going to remove the Harfoot story from the season, I'm not going to cut it out of the show entirely. Say in their future second season, Nori and the Wizard will meet Galadriel. What I would do is begin season 2 with one or two episodes telling the entire Nori and Wizard story. This storyline as it is was dragged out far longer than it needed to be. You cannot convince me that this story cannot be effectively told in around 75 minutes, which is the upper end of a single episode in this series. So say season 2 episode 1 tells the entire Harfoot story, and then season 2 episode 2 cuts back to Galadriel. If they meet in season 2 episode 3, then the pacing is far better than it would have been with the current Rings of Power. And you know what? You can still leave the shots of the meteor from the perspective of everyone else in season 1. This way it leaves an aura of mystery that could keep the audience invested throughout season 1. Maybe even finish the season off with a glimpse of the wizard to tease the second season. So that is how I would change the Harfoot storyline. If it doesn't affect anything in season 1, then it doesn't need to be in the season. Now what about the rest of the show? Well, here is how I would change things. I would begin the first few episodes by only following Galadriel and Elrond. So instead of following four storylines, the audience is only following two. And since Galadriel and Elrond are both characters from the Lord of the Rings movies, the audience is already familiar with them and thus a bit more invested. For the first three or four episodes, I would only focus on the Numenor and Casa Doom stories. Everything would pretty much play out the same way for the first half of the season. Once Galadriel, Halbrand, and the Numenorians arrive on Middle-earth, instead of having them arrive in the middle of a battle, I would have them arrive at the beginning of the Southland story. Maybe Galadriel would meet up with Arondir, and then she would warn him about Sauron trying to turn the Southlands into his own lands, and then they would find the holes in the ground, Arondir would get captured, Theo would find the sword, and all that jazz. What are the Numenorians going to do while the Southland story unfolds? Well, you could just easily have them somewhere else in the Southlands, waiting for Galadriel to return with news or something. And say after Arondir gets back from his imprisonment, Galadriel goes off to find the Numenorians, and then they will all arrive back in the middle of the battle right before the volcano erupts. Therefore, the rest of the season would play out the exact same way. So if the writers really wanted to tell this story with this narrative with these exact character arcs, I think my approach would greatly benefit the series. But unfortunately, I get the vibe the storytellers initially wanted the series to have this grand scale, because you know the Lord of the Rings movies had this gigantic scale. But what they failed to realize is that the original trilogy took its time before it expanded the story. Almost the entirety of the Fellowship of the Ring follows one narrative thread, and that's Frodo's story. We're only introduced to new characters when Frodo is introduced to them. So the entire first movie set the foundation of this trilogy, and then it was the two towers that really expanded the scope. The Rings of Power tried to do everything in the first episode, and thus it didn't really work. So the pacing of the show wasn't all that great. But unfortunately, the Rings of Power has a lot of other issues it needs to worry about. Before I continue on with the rest of this video, only 12.1% of my viewers are subscribed to this channel. So if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you. Chapter 3, Galadriel and Numenor. First, let's discuss the main character of the series, and that's Galadriel. Even though there are four main plot lines throughout this series, as I've explained before, Galadriel by far gets the most screen time. So even if the other three stories were pretty good, it's Galadriel's story that matters the most. The writers used Galadriel to try and teach a lesson on vengeance. All season long, the writers make it a focus to show that Galadriel is consumed by her quest to destroy Sauron. In the opening scene, she takes a company of elves to the Northern 
wastelands, where all they find is another potential Sauron clue. When she demands to press forward, the entire company mutinies against her and vows to go back home. When they return, Gil-galad, Elrond, and the other elves conspire behind Galadriel's back to send her to Valinor because she's doing more harm than good in Middle-earth. Even after she acknowledges she was basically exiled out of Middle-earth because of her actions, she continues to bully, threaten, intimidate, and insult others along her way to find Sauron. When she finally convinces the Numenorians to travel to the Southlands, she is faced with nothing but ash and smoke. There's a few moments after the eruption of Mount Doom where she appears to have gone on this arc. She gives some advice to Theo about not being consumed by darkness, and at the end of the season when she sacrifices her brother's dagger to create the Rings of Power, it's supposed to be symbolic of her letting go of her vengeful ways, and I guess the series leads us to believe in season 2 onward, she will be closer to the Gladriel we had seen in the movies. Now, I really like the idea of this arc, but man, there are so many ways this could have been done better. Usually when there's an arc like this where our main hero is slowly trending towards the dark side, we see what the character is like at their best. So the contrast in their turn to darkness is something we actively root against. When we see Frodo get consumed by the ring, this is a painful moment for the viewers to watch because we know that Frodo is not an evil or vile person. And seeing the ring win the battle against Frodo is the thing we've been dreading all throughout the trilogy. So while we had seen how good-hearted Frodo was in the beginning of the Fellowship, we don't get a moment like that with Galadriel. Right when the series begins with the prologue, child Galadriel seems like the brash self will end up seeing all season. When one of the other elf boys destroys her paper boat, the first thing she does is jump on him and try to beat him up. And then when we see her for the first time as an adult, she's no different. She's leading these elves into danger seemingly against all their wishes. The writers want us to believe that the reason she is like this is because Morgoth killed her brother. But by having child Galadriel and opening scene adult Galadriel seem like the same person, this tells the viewer that this is just who she is. The writers wanted to tell a story on how vengeance consumed a person for the worse, but in reality they're telling a story of an already vengeful person, and those are not the same story. Because if we don't know that our character was once good-hearted, then we don't have a desire to root for them to turn back from their vengeful path. Going back to Frodo, if he was always an asshole and evil from the start, then we don't really care all that much seeing him consumed by the ring. But because we know Frodo is a good-hearted person and we like that version of Frodo, we are rooting for him to turn back to who he once was. So with Galadriel, since there was never a version of the character we ever liked or saw was good, why should we be invested in seeing her lose her vengeful ways? And that is probably the biggest issue with her arc. Most people criticize Galadriel for being unlikable or being a terrible person, and those are kind of vague complaints because anyone can just say character X is unlikable, so I hope my comparisons between Frodo and Galadriel's stories help explain why I don't find her to be a character worth rooting for. So here's how I would change the beginning of the story to make Galadriel a character we want to root for, and frankly my changes are quite minor. So we can have this opening scene with the elves in the north looking for Sauron, except Galadriel isn't there. The elves find the clue of Sauron and return back to Linden. When we return back to Linden and we meet Galadriel, we see her as this kind and loving woman we know her to be from the movies. She's pleasant to be around, we see her kind around others, and she's nothing like the Galadriel we know from the show. Remember, to begin the series there hasn't been a hint of Sauron still being alive in hundreds of years. So this version of Galadriel has somewhat made peace with that, but we get a hint that it still somewhat haunts her. Once those elves from the opening return home, they tell Galadriel that they found a hint of Sauron's return. Galadriel at first rejects this and says Sauron is gone, but we can tell deep down that this troubles her. She's still traumatized from the death of her brother, so she goes in denial that this news could be true. Gil-galad still rewards Galadriel with the honor of returning home in Valinor, except this time they're not trying to exile her, they're actually trying to honor her. In the current show, we can tell she doesn't like this at all. In fact, it annoys her. So in my soft rewrite, this is going to be the thing that she's been looking the most forward to for a long time. She couldn't be happier to return to Valinor. But the recent news that Sauron may still be alive continues to haunt her. Come the end of the first episode, when she jumps off the ship, it's just something we expected her to do. But by changing the story to Galadriel wanting to go back to Valinor, when she jumps off the ship, it becomes a noble act. Galadriel would be so close to happiness, but because there is just a slight chance that Sauron is still alive, she sacrifices her happiness to discover the truth. This would be something admirable, and therefore we would start to root for her. The rest of the next few episodes can pretty much follow the same beats. She'll find Halbrand, she'll end up in 
Numenor, and she'll convince them to go to the Southlands. Except instead of her being a bully the whole time, she will progressively turn into that person. In the second episode when she meets Halbrand, she'll still mostly be this kind person, but after she's given more of a reason to believe Sauron is still alive, her desperation and fear is what turns her into the unlikable bully we currently get in the series. When she has that confrontation with Adar in the sixth episode, seeing her talk about genocide against the orcs can be the moment where we see how dark Galadriel has come from the character we knew in the pilot episode. I believe it was in the fifth episode where she has this conversation with Halbrand, where she admits to herself that she can't stop, and it's a great scene, but afterwards she still doesn't change, so that moment kind of feels wasted. If we move that to after the eruption of Mount Doom, it would be far more impactful. See how I pretty much changed nothing of the plot, and how simply changing Galadriel's attitude and perspective can have a drastic change on the viewer's investment in the story? But if we were to make this change, a change, mind you, I think would greatly help the character, there's still another major issue with her arc. Her current story does not follow the cardinal rule of storytelling, and it's that characters must suffer the consequences of their actions. In any good character arc, a character has a flaw that leads them to making poor decisions, and then they must suffer the consequences of those poor decisions. Whether it's my version of the story or the current show version of the story, when Gladriel arrives in the Southlands, she doesn't suffer any consequences for her vengeful and threatening nature. Whether or not she and the Numenorians arrive, Mount Doom still erupts. Adar gives the key to this guy and he activates the volcano with or without Galadriel. In the seventh episode, Galadriel has these moments where we see a visible change in her character. I really like her scenes with Theo because she sees the dark path he's about to go on and she warns him about that path, but she doesn't have a good reason to change because she didn't make any mistakes here. Sure, she could have opened the damn wrapping of the key and realized it was just a hatchet, but I don't think that's the consequence the story should be looking at. Now you could argue that the consequence of her actions are all the Numenorians that died fighting for the Southlands. Elendil eventually hates her because Asilador is supposedly dead. But that consequence doesn't work because we all know Asilador isn't dead. So even though she might feel shame for causing Asilador's death, it's not a real consequence because Asilador's alive. Now the other consequence you can argue exists is Galadriel saving Halbrand. Sure, this can be something she faces the consequences of later on, but in season one, her relationship with Halbrand hasn't caused anything bad. It's really strange to think that Halbrand, aka Sauron, had no impact in the creation of Mordor. Imagine if all series Galadriel was vouching for Halbrand to be the king of the Southlands, and once they arrive, Halbrand betrays Galadriel and allows the key to be used to create Mordor? Maybe it was Halbrand who switched the key for this hatchet when no one was looking. If this happened, the creation of Mordor would not only be caused by Sauron, something we all probably would have liked, but it would also be Galadriel's fault because Halbrand was in the Southlands because of her. And boom, she would have suffered the consequences of her actions. But no, that doesn't happen. Now, season two has a chance to remedy this. Halbrand asks Galadriel how the other elves would feel if they knew Sauron was still alive because of her. I'm sure at some point this consequence will be realized, but we'll just have to wait and see. The last thing I want to touch on with Galadriel is the ending of the season. As I said before, her giving up that dagger is supposed to be symbolic of her giving up her vengeful ways. The dagger once belonged to her brother, and her brother's death is what has put her down this dark path. Also, the dagger is a weapon, and her getting rid of it can be symbolic of her no longer being willing to resort to violence. But is that really going to happen? I don't get the vibe that she's going to stop her quest for hunting Sauron. If anything, since she knows for sure Sauron is alive and that she's personally responsible for his return, I have more reason to believe she will continue down that path. But again, we'll just have to wait and see. And that is my analysis of Galadriel. It's a shame because there's such an interesting story baked in the foundation of her arc, it's just the writers misfired almost entirely on making that story come to form. Chapter 4 Elrond and Casa Doom. Now, unlike Galadriel's story, I think almost everything about Elrond's story works. Emphasis on almost. I don't know about you or whatever Tolkien preaches, but when I think about Lord of the Rings, the first thing I think about is friendship. Lord of the Rings to me was all about the people from all corners of the world coming together to fight evil. The fellowship consisted of so many different kinds of people. Maybe my favorite relationship in the movies was Legolas and Gimli's. The friendship between this elf and dwarf was so wholesome. It's also Sam's unwavering friendship and loyalty to Frodo 
Grotto that led to the destruction of the Ring. So in the Rings of Power, the relationship between Durin and Elrond is the only one that has heart even remotely close to the Lord of the Rings movies. So after Galadriel leaves, Gil-galad tells Elrond that he will be working with Celebrimbor on some project. Celebrimbor tells Elrond that they need a large workforce to build this tower or whatever, and Elrond suggests the dwarves. When he arrived at Khazad Doom, already the world building here was so much better than other parts of the show. Having this contest where a challenger has to break stones against a dwarf until one of them cracks was so perfect for the dwarven culture. I don't know if that was a token idea or Amazons, but either way I loved it. Now Elrond doesn't have a season-long arc. He has a mini one in the beginning that I thought was done fairly well. So Elrond arrives at Khazad Doom and he thinks all is well between him and Durin. But Durin is pissed because Elrond hasn't visited in 20 years and he missed Durin's wedding and the birth of his kids. What I liked about this is the lesson that Elrond learned. Because he is an elf who lives forever, he doesn't value time the same way the other species do. Elrond wasn't intentionally trying to hurt Durin by not visiting in all these years, he was simply unaware of how much his actions were hurting his friend. In just the second episode of the season, Elrond faces a consequence of his actions, something Galadriel never had to do. So instead of making excuses or trying to convince Durin he's overreacting, he gives a sincere apology and vows not to make that mistake again. Now the actual plot of this section of the story was a bit confusing, but I think it kind of worked. So the elves send Elrond to Casa Doom because they know they need Mithril and they know the dwarves have some. Initially they don't tell Elrond this, so when Elrond vows not to betray Durin's trust about keeping the Mithril secret, he's unaware that this is what the elves really want. When Gil-galad and Celebrimbor ask Elrond if the dwarves have Mithril, this is where Elrond's loyalty is tested. Is he going to betray the trust of the friend he just rebuilt his friendship with to help his own people? It's a great moral dilemma that I felt kept this storyline interesting. Now this whole Mithril part of the story isn't what makes it interesting to me, but the continuous ways in which Durand and Elrond grow their friendship. Most people when discussing movies or shows talk about the importance of character development. And while it is certainly important, having relationship development is arguably just as important. This entire subplot depends on buying the friendship between Elrond and Durin, and thankfully we do buy it. Some of my favorite moments between the two are not when they're talking about Mithril or the elves, it's when they're sharing stories or joking around that make them such close friends. Like when Durin suggests that Durin isn't his real name and that he only tells his real name to his close friends and family, and then he's about to tell Elrond what that name is, that's a great moment that builds friendship. Another moment is when Durin makes up this story about the table and then he and Elrond just laugh about it. That is the shit that close friends do. A rather serious scene that showed the strength of their friendship was when Elrond vowed to keep the Mithril a secret. He didn't just promise to keep the secret, he went above and beyond and swore on his father's memory he wouldn't say anything. That moment showed not only how much he values his friendship with Durin, but how sorry he was for not being there for 20 years. Now it's more than just words that build friendships, it's also actions. Seeing Durin go into the mines to find Mithril strictly against his father's wishes shows how much he cares for Elrond. He's willing to risk his own life and his relationship to his father to help Elrond. If you are writing your own story and the friendship between two characters is the emotional core, then having moments like the ones I mentioned are crucial. But it's not even just that. The moments where Durin and Elrond aren't together continue to strengthen their relationship. When Gil-galad asks Elrond to break his vow, Elrond refuses without hesitation. Whenever Durin is talking to his dad about the elves, he continuously reminds his father how much Elrond means to him and that he sees him like a brother. I wouldn't classify Elrond and Durin's relationship as a masterclass in character development, but it was done well for a series that so many people seem to say has few redeeming qualities. Almost every scene these two share together I found to be incredibly engaging. Unlike Galadriel, I found Elrond to be a character I was rooting for, because he has a strong moral compass, but he's not perfect and he's going to make mistakes. Now as I said before, I found the plot here to be a bit confusing and a bit contrived. So the immortality in the elves is running out on Middle Earth. In order to stop that from happening, they need to get Mithril. And they need to get said Mithril quickly because if they don't by spring, they will all be forced to leave or die. That's a bit contrived, don't you think? They end up not getting enough Mithril, but after all hope is lost, Halbrand suggests to Celebrimbor that they can mix the Mithril with other alloys to amplify its qualities. Uh, sure? I find it surprising that Celebrimbor, the supposed best architect and smith in the world, would need Halbrand's help figuring this out. But Halbrand is really Sauron, so I get it. Then the solution to all the elves' problems is to turn the Mithril into a circle so it can continue to loop on itself to amplify its effect. I guess I'm not the person to question Middle-earth magic, but all this just feels too contrived to me, I don't know. Either way, while the plotline kinda makes little sense, it was the characters that carried this part of the story.
story, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing more of Elrond and Durin in the future. Chapter 5, Arondir and the Southlands. So with Arondir and the Southlands, I thought a lot of it was okay. First with the characters, I thought Arondir was somewhat likable. I wouldn't say he was a well-developed character, but he was likable. Arondir is probably the closest we'll get to Legolas in this show. He's this stoic elf who has some pretty badass moves and is always willing to help others out. What I like about Arondir is that he had no reason to get involved with the Southlands at all, but he decided to stick around and fight anyway. In the first episode, he was recalled to return to Linden, I believe, but after hints of evil were going around, he decided to stay. I find it hilarious that this whole subplot with Adar and the Yorks in the Southlands began because a sick cow managed to make its way to Bronwyn and spew black goo out of its udders. If this cow never shows up, then Arondir leaves the Southlands and all the humans get screwed even faster. When it comes to Bronwyn and Theo, they're fine. I didn't dislike them. I do find it peculiar that Bronwyn became the leader of this town for the Southlands. She kind of just walked in in the second episode with an orc's head, and from that moment onwards, everyone followed her. I just don't buy her as leader of the Southlands. Her speeches weren't all that convincing, so that didn't help either. The whole elf and human romance could have gone terribly wrong, but I thought it was actually done well. It wasn't distracting or really a big part of the story anyway, so I don't mind seeing more of them going forward. The question I do have has to do with the people of the Southlands. Is this town and the one the orcs attacked in the first episode the entirety of the Southlands? Oh, and I guess the town where the season ends too. We don't see anyone else ever show up, and the Southlands appear to be quite big on a map. When Gladry was talking about the importance of reinstating a king in the Southlands, I just pictured that king having to rule over more than a hundred people. Maybe I'm forgetting a detail where a group from a different town showed up, but I always got the vibe that the people of the Southlands were quite few. The part of this subplot that I did find the most interesting was with Adar and the orcs. Maybe it's just because most of the characters in this show aren't three-dimensional, but I found Adar to be quite the complex character. This fallen elf willing to commit himself to helping the orcs and give them a home was interesting. He's Usually the best scene is when he verbally outclasses Galadriel. Since Galadriel has been acting like a lunatic all season, it was nice to see someone put her in her place. I also like the moment where he sent all the traitor humans to fight instead of his orcs. It was one of the few moments that genuinely surprised me in this show. My biggest issue with the whole Southland story is that there's no character work here. I do like most of the characters and they do have some good moments, but there's no arc or lesson attempting to be conveyed. Earlier in the video I suggested that the Southland story shouldn't kick in until after Galadriel arrives with the Numenorians, and a big reason why is because currently there is no story with the Southlanders, just plot. So if Galadriel is a more active part of the Southland story, then you could tie it into her arc and give it some thematic weight. Even though I like Arondir, I don't think he works as the main character of this subplot. He's just not interesting enough, and kinda like Legolas, he would work much better as a supporting character to someone more thematically rich. So those are my thoughts on Arondir and the Southland story. It has some fine moments and decent characters, but overall it just wasn't engaging enough to keep me totally invested. Chapter 6, Nori and the Harfoots. So now we have the Harfoots story, and I've already explained my biggest issue with this subplot. The Harfoots have no relevance to the rest of the story, and it doesn't matter if they'll come into play in the second season. It's unfair to ask your viewers to stay invested in a subplot for a whole season not knowing how it will be important. You can remove this subplot from the season entirely, and none of Galadriel's, Elrond's, or Arondir's stories would be affected. This is why I suggested telling this entire Harfoot story in the first episode of the second season. I am convinced that you can trim this this Harfoot story down to 75 minutes. Half the episodes in season 1 don't even show the Harfoots. Now the only argument I've heard for the relevance of the Harfoots outside of season 2 prospects is the added mystery of who Sauron is. Of course there was tons of mystery of who Halbrand really was, and having the stranger also be a bit of a mystery led to more speculation if he was really Sauron. This ties into what I said before, adding mystery just to surprise hardcore Tolkien fans is a bad idea, and this is a lesson I hope the showrunners learn in season 2. But they still Still haven't resolved the mystery of the stranger. Sure, we know he's not Sauron and that he's just a wizard, but since there are only five wizards in Tolkien's lore, that gives us a short list of which wizard he'll end up becoming. And since they are dragging this mystery on for multiple seasons, that probably means he's gonna end up becoming Gandalf, so it can have a big payoff. If they're really ballsy, they'll make him Saruman, but it will most likely be Gandalf. Moving on, I feel that the only reason they were included into the season is so Amazon could sell viewers that hobbits would be in the show. There was a quote from one of the showrunners 
showrunners that said you can't have a Lord of the Rings story without hobbits, and that's just not true. That's like saying you can't have a Star Wars story without Jedi. Sure, the Jedi are great to have, but some of the best Star Wars works don't have any Jedi involved. So no, the Rings of Power didn't need hobbits to make this a Lord of the Rings story. For now, let's ignore all of that. Does this story on its own actually work? The feelings I have towards this are similar to how I felt about Arondir in the Southlands. It was fine. I liked a lot of the Harfoot characters, including Nori. She's kind of the opposite of Frodo. Frodo wants to live his life peacefully in the Shire, and then he gets dragged into a perilous adventure. Nori, on the other hand, wants to have more adventures in her life, and is displeased with her mundane existence as a Harfoot. That's why when the stranger falls from the sky, she takes an interest in him. Nori never annoyed me like she annoyed others. I found her to be mostly sweet, and her growing relationship with the stranger does have potential. But just like the Southlands plot, this plot has some okay characters, but no real story. Just events play out until Nori leaves with the stranger. I think the goal of the writers was to convey a similar feeling we have with the Harfoots to that of the Hobbits. That these creatures may be small, but have big hearts. That's what Nori's dad tries to preach at the end of the season. But the big issue here is that the Harfoots don't have big hearts. Nori does, but not the rest of them. One could argue that the Harfoots are some of the most vile and cold-hearted people on Middle-earth. These are a group of people who migrate many times a year, and when someone gets left behind or is struggling, instead of helping each other out, they leave them to die. And then they have the audacity to read out the names of those left behind in a prayer. Most of them would probably still be alive if the rest of the Harfoots just waited or helped each other out. In what world are these people big-hearted? My favorite moment was when one of the Harfoot women suggested that they sabotage the Brandyfoot cart, and then they get left behind to die. What the fuck? That's straight up evil! So even though the Harfoots may look like hobbits, they do not have any of that heart that the hobbits had. So besides the pacing, that is probably the biggest issue with this subplot. The writers wanted them to evoke the same emotions that the hobbits did, but their beliefs and actions are the antithesis of the hobbits. So overall, the Harfoot story like the Southland story was fine, but it could have been so much better. So, The Rings of Power one year later. It certainly hasn't aged well amongst the fans. This series is planned to have five seasons, so it's certainly possible that the writers could write the ship, but part of me doesn't think that's gonna happen. Sure, there are great aspects of this series. I often found the music to be spectacular, and almost never does the show look cheap. This is easily the most impressive looking TV series by a mile, and even though the characters weren't all that great, I found the acting to be superb. Earlier in the video, I mentioned a big lesson studios need to learn. In this lesson is the baggage that comes with adaptation. Don't title your series The Lord of the Rings and expect everyone to be happy with the changes you're making to the source material. And more importantly, don't expect them to be happy with the reasons you're making changes to the source material. Throughout history, there are franchises that put out movies or shows that are initially hated, but over time, some hardcore fans grow to like those hated stories. I have a very tough time believing that The Rings of Power is going to go down that route. But remember, only 20% of the story has been told. It's certainly certainly not impossible. Is Lord of the Rings the Rings of Power the colossal failure that you remember it to be? Or are there some redeeming qualities? Let me know down below. Thank you everyone so much for watching another one of my videos. Don't forget to make the Glon Squad and I will see you guys next time.